G'day, mates. Oh, that's, that's terrible. For my Australian viewers, I apologize for the sins I have just committed against you. However, I am looking at one of the most famous Australian fossils, and that's Coolasuchus. Coolasuchus was an interesting animal coming from the middle Cretaceous of the southernmost part of Australia, specifically in the state of Victoria. In fact, it's actually been voted as the Victoria State Fossil Emblem. It also got a lot of notoriety, though, from its appearance in the Spirits of the Ice Forest episode of Walking with Dinosaurs, a 1999 documentary that was really kind of the first of its kind. It was a very big and high production value documentary focusing on paleontology. And the particular episode that features Coolasuchus looked at some of the fossils coming from Dinosaur Cove and nearby areas in Southern Australia. And in fact, during the Cretaceous, this would have been pretty close or even potentially below the Antarctic Circle which actually means a lot of things for Coolasuchus. First of all, it means that its name is actually kind of has two parts or two meanings. And that's because Cool actually comes from Leslie Cool, who is the researcher who actually prepared the fossil. But it also lived in a cool area as that episode showed. So Coolasuchus also could mean cool environment Asuchus, which is just crocodile. But it wasn't a crocodilian. And actually, it seems like the crocodilians may have had something to do with its demise later on. However, right now we want to focus just on it, and what do we actually know about it? Well, unlike what was shown in Walking with Dinosaurs, we really don't know a ton about it. A lot of what was shown in that documentary were kind of inferences made from some of its closer relatives, and even some modern day animals. So let's put all that together to understand what Kulasukas was doing and what exactly the hell it was. Now, first off, Coolasuchus was described only in 1997, and this would have been into the production of Walking with Dinosaurs, but they were already aware of this fossil, it just hadn't been fully described and given a name yet. And the thing is, the fossil isn't very complete. There's a part of the lower jaw, some ribs and vertebra, part of the lower legs, and then also a little bit of the pelvic girdle. So it's really not a lot to work off of. However, there has been some more material found since then, including a partial skull, but that also hasn't been described yet, which means we actually need to compare Coolasuchus to some of its closest relatives, and that means we need to look broadly into the temnospondyls. Based on the relatively small legs and the shape of the vertebra and the ribs, we can assume that Coolasuchus was a temnospondyl, and that's actually really interesting because the temnospondyls were really common earlier in the Mesozoic and especially in the Paleozoic before the Permian-Triassic extinction that killed off most life on land. They were one of the few groups that made it through and ended up being really successful in the Triassic before dwindling in numbers. And Coolasuchus may have actually been one of the last of them, but what were they? Well, the Temnospondyls you can think of as almost precursors to amphibians. There's actually still a lot of debate of where modern day amphibians come from, because you have a number of things that are kind of salamander-like from a few different groups, and then suddenly you have true salamanders, and as well as that, true frogs and true Sicilians. Sicilians are some strange amphibians that are kind of worm-like that live today, and they're really not as well known as things like frogs and salamanders, but they are amphibians. And the thing is, again, we don't really know how exactly these groups are related in the fossil record. We have genetics that can tell us how they were related, but we don't know where they came from. They could have come from the temnospondyls, or the Lepospondyls. But the thing is, no matter which of those groups they came from, that does mean that they would have been the Temnospondyls, and by extension, Coolasuchus' closest living relatives. But Coolasuchus was larger than any living amphibian, probably getting up to about 10 to 12 feet long, or three to four meters, as opposed to the largest amphibian today, which could only reach five feet, or a little over a meter and a half, and those being the Chinese and Japanese giant salamanders. But we can actually compare some of their morphology to some of the morphology in things like Coolasuchus and some of its close relatives. The first part of this is that their skulls are kind of like toilet seats. And if you wonder what I mean, it's look at the shape of some of its relatives' skulls. They're kind of shaped like toilet seats. And in fact, I would imagine there's somebody out there who could sew a toilet seat cover that actually looks like one of these, which would be really funny to me. But that aside, that does mean we can potentially understand how it may have hunted or otherwise fed on prey. And there hasn't been a lot of work on this in Coolasuchus or many other of the Temnospondyls. In fact, most research on Temnospondyls 
is just to try and figure out how they were related to one another and how potentially they may have been related to modern amphibians. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done on this group. But when we compare it to some of the modern amphibians, specifically the giant salamanders I mentioned earlier, we can see those giant salamanders are suction feeders, meaning they open their mouth, water rushes in, and prey or whatever other food item there is gets caught in that same suction and then it can eat it. And the thing is, that hard bony skull could have been an adaptation for that kind of feeding, where it gives a hard plate that's immovable, and then when the bottom jaw opens up, the space that is underneath that hard immovable plate of the upper skull actually helps to create that suction and that space where the water can rush in, bringing prey with it. And we can see this in some of the other temnospondyls that are related to Kulosuchus, like Pelorocephalus, which as you can see had a very bony head. So it seems like this may have been an adaptation they had, but until there's more specific research, it's really hard to tell. But if I were a betting man, I would put my money on it being a suction feeder, as opposed to what's shown in Walking with Dinosaurs, where it actually shoots itself from the water like a crocodilian to try and catch a Leanosaura, a small dinosaur that lived at the same time. Meanwhile, it's also shown scavenging an already dead Leanosaura in that same documentary, which seems pretty reasonable. It probably would have been a kind of a generalist once it got to that size, because as you get larger, you really don't get to select what food sources you can or can't rely on. You need to rely on whatever you can get. And then for the other main thing about Kulosuchus is we need to go back to that cold environment, because even in the documentary, it's shown moving to smaller ponds and brewmating, which brewmating is just kind of a type of hibernation. It's a little bit different, but the details are pretty minor. It's essentially hibernation for most intense in purposes. But it does actually have some similarities to some modern day animals which do also brumate. In fact, near me in the part of the Colorado Plateau where I'm at, we have boreal chorus frogs, which they're frogs, but during the winter it gets pretty cold, so what do they do? Well, what they end up doing is they go to the very bottom of the ponds that they normally live in and bury themselves in the mud. While they do that, they actually are able to lower their body temperatures to near the temperature of the water, so just above freezing, and are able to actually survive through the winter that way, and then be able to start living again and actually moving around during the next spring. There's actually another type of frog, some of the wood frogs that actually live up very close or even above the Arctic Circle, which do a similar thing, except they can actually freeze most of the water in their bodies and actually still come out of that essentially defrosting and thawing out in the spring and still living normal, healthy lives. So while Kulosuchus and its relatives are pretty understudied, it does mean that Kulosuchus and its relatives probably had some sort of physiological and behavioral adaptations that let them succeed in this very cold environment. And when we're thinking about this Cretaceous environment though too, we need to keep in mind that the main reason it was this cold is because Kulosuchus lived so far south. During the Cretaceous, there was a lot of CO2 in the world, actually almost as much as we have in our atmosphere now, and we've actually only just passed the amount that it did have in the atmosphere during the Cretaceous. So there was a ton of CO2, and in general, the planet was warmer. But again, being so close to the Antarctic Circle means Kulosuchus did still live somewhere that was pretty cold and for at least months of the year, probably didn't experience any kind of sunlight at all. During this part of the Cretaceous, Australia was still actually connected to Antarctica very much below on the bottom of the Earth. But eventually that relationship and those geologic contacts started to break up. And that means that Australia started drifting northward. And that means that for the Temnospondyls, that essentially there was a death sentence on them. Because they weren't well adapted to deal with some of the things that evolved while they had already become established. The first Temnospondyls actually show up all the way in the Permian over 50 million years before even the first dinosaurs and crocodilians showed up. And that made them very successful even once they made it through the Permian-Triassic extinction into the Triassic. For example, there's one type of fossil, Anishisma, which comes from many different areas, but it also includes the petrified forest, where there are dozens of specimens. They find them actually pretty regularly, and it's really cool that we can understand this part of their evolution. But the thing is, as time continues on past the Triassic, the crocodilians seem to take over many of the waterways, and we find less and less temnospondyls, until finally Kulosuchus is the last known temnospondyl. It's the closest to us in time. 
And it seems like that northward movement of Australia may have been that death sentence for the tennis bundles, because it seems like those crocodilians, once it actually got warm enough for them to be successful in the environment, potentially just outcompeted things like Kulasukis, which may have bred slower, or may just not have been as efficient of feeders. It's really hard to know without actually being able to study these animals in great detail. And even if we had a perfect one, it's something we still may never know. But it does help to highlight how even throughout large periods of times, animals can be very successful until suddenly they're just not because of other animals developing in the same environment or environmental conditions like Australia drifting northwards, changing the environment they're in. It's really unfortunate. And the thing is, Kulasukis doesn't have any one feature that makes it really unique or super interesting or incredibly, incredibly cool. Except for its name, which is Kulasukis, of course. But it is a really great animal to highlight the diversity and finally the fall of what was once a great lineage of very large amphibian-like animals.